Hi everybody, welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast episode 15, where it is our mission to create worlds out of words. I'm Hannah Heath, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of the Terebinth Tree Connor- Ugh, I'm coming out strong here. <laughs> I'm not even going to bother editing this out. I am the author of the Terebinth Tree Chronicles, Guys of Dripping Gold, and Vengeance Hunter. I'm also the multimedia manager for PFW. And I am joined today by fellow PFW authors Beth Wengler and Janelle Garrett. We're going to talk about writing lessons learned from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings universe. So lots of good stuff to look forward to in that. Uh, podcasters, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm the PFW art coordinator. I write fairy tales and Christian fantasy. Um, so I, my fairy tale is The Weaver's Blessing, and then I'm also writing The Firstborn's Legacy Saga, and I wrote The the Word Thrower short story. And I am Janelle Garrett. I am the special events coordinator. I write um, epic fantasy and flintlock fantasy. So my epic fantasy um, series is called The Steward Saga. And my Flintlock uh, fantasy series is called The Rhodesia Chronicles. We both have stewards, which is very exciting. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> Anyways, so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. And Janelle, you just had a recent release this month. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. It is called The Coming Light. It is the uh, second volume of The Rhodesia Chronicles. Nice. Yep. Awesome. And Beth, you have some cool stuff coming up. Yeah. So actually, the day that this podcast comes out, I'm going to be featured on Lore Haven's book club, which is on Facebook. Um, so they're featuring Child of the Cates, my fantasy novel. And I'm planning some fun things for that. So cool opportunities to get prizes and such. Um, there will be more details to when you guys are listening to this today. <laughs> Yay! That's awesome. Um, so other pieces of awesome news from other PFW authors would be um, Nate Philbrick finally publicly released the cover for The Wasteling Crow on his website. Ooh! <laughs> I doubted that would ever happen. I know! It is so beautiful. <laughs> yes. Well worth the wait. It's gorgeous. It was, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and also, two pieces of news from E.B. Dawson. Uh, she released the cover for Until the End, which is the fourth creation of Jack book that I am really excited about. The cover is amazing, and I'm sure the book yes. is incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful, that cover. You guys got to go go see it. Yes. Oh, and they look so cool all together. Mm -hmm. I know. I can't wait to have them all on my shelf, and I'm just going to take so many pictures. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Um, and then she's also, uh, E.B. Dawson also released, or announced the release of The Voyage of the Pequod, which is a sci-fi retelling of Moby Dick. Um, the cover's amazing, and the story itself looks really cool. That'll be coming out on May, tw sometime in May 2019, or I don't know why I read the year out. It's coming out sometime this May. <laughs> it is so amazing. I got to read it and, like, help give some feedback and stuff. It is by far my favorite sci-fi so Ooh. Mm, it's, high it's great well I'm not a huge sci-fi fan to begin with but I loved this one so that I guess that is the high praise <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah and J.E. Brazzi did that um cover right she painted yeah. them, which was phenomenal yes mm -hmm. so yes. cool so I'm going to link all of this news um, in the description so you can go look at all the beautiful covers and see Beth's Lorehaven and Janelle Garrett's The Coming Light because it's all super cool. So if you want more information, go check out the links. Yay. All right. So that's it for news. And now we can move into story time. So what interesting stories did we have for this month? Oh, well, um, my writer's block finally lifted. Um, Woo, yay. You guys, writer's block is awful, <laughs> but when it lifts, it makes a whole new world appear. Um, and uh, I was having point of view issues with my fourth book of the Steward saga. And if any of you have read it, there's so many point of views. So you can probably understand why I was having issues. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, but one of those point of views is going to be justice. And so um, I was having issues with her 
And yeah, if you've read the books, you can probably understand why that would be the case as well. So anyway, justice is now behaving. Yay. And I can the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. awesome, because that was a long slump, I think, for you, wasn't it? It was. It was several months, and it was very frustrating. Oh. But it's over now, so. Whew. Yay. That is good. Um, I've also kind of had a slump in writing. Um, I noticed back in October, I was writing like a thousand words an hour when I actually was focused on writing. And then, like the end of January I was writing if I was lucky 200 words an hour which is significantly less and I was just trying to figure out like what is going on I love this story I know this character and I realized that I hadn't been taking time off like I would go to work teach all day then come home and get straight to writing and write until I went to bed and then on the weekends I would do more author things (laughs) And so I was really convicted by that, that I was working way too much. And I've taken a step back. I'm forcing myself to take a day off every week. I think I need that drastic action. Um, And it is very challenging to not work on these things that I love all the time. But Mm -hmm. I'm noticing that it is helping. I'm up to like somewhere around three to six hundred words an hour, just as using that as a gauge of my internal health. So yeah, that has been my journey (laughs) the last couple months. That's impressive. Not going to lie. A thousand words an hour. I know. Uh, (laughs) Not happening right now. (laughs) But I'm in shock. That's crazy. But wow. But good for you though. Taking that break. That's all. I understand. That's really hard. Yeah. It's also really hard to rest, especially because I love everything I do. I love teaching and I love writing, but I'm more than just a productivity machine and I need to remember that. Yep, that's good. good. Which makes me curious. So when you are resting, what do you do? Because I think I'm like you and that I'm always doing writing. So I don't even know what I would do if I wasn't either going to school or writing. (laughs) What does that look like for you? Uh, well, I've been watching Doctor Who again. Nice. I like I ended up canceling Netflix and everything because I just never watched anything. So I have watched a couple seasons of Doctor Who in the last month. Um, and that's been weird to watch TV again. <laughs> and I just say I can't do anything productive. Okay. I can't do anything that I could make a profit off of or that would help further my business. So... Mm-hmm. I crochet, I bake, I uh, exercise, I paint things that I'm never going to sell. (laughs) (laughs) Things like that. That is so cool. And I go to bed early. Going to bed early also. That's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm so glad that's working. (laughs) Me too. I'm very thankful. (laughs) So it looks like for all three of us, we've been in in weird writing slump areas because my story is also along the same lines. Um, My life has been really chaotic these last couple months, um, and this semester for college has been particularly hard. So for a couple of weeks, I wasn't able to write at all, and then I remembered something that I had heard from indie author Ray Elliott, who mentioned that she, like me, has a chronic illness. It gets in the way of her writing. And so what she does is she makes it a point to write for five minutes every day. So I thought, okay, (laughs) I'm going to try this. So I've been doing five to ten minutes every night. um, And, you know, it's not a lot of words, but it's better than what I was doing before, which was zero words. (laughs) So that's been really nice, but also kind of frustrating. So it's been requiring this paradigm shift of, like, I'm not doing as much as I want to be doing but I'm still actually writing, and so that's the important thing. So that's been good and bad at the same time. So I think it'll, in the long run, be really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, our worth is not based upon our productivity. I think that's something we're we're all learning, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. Yeah, it's a good lesson to learn. Yeah. It's a hard lesson to learn, but yeah, it's a good lesson. Yeah. To learn. And I think it's one we have to learn over and over, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, all right, so that's it for our um, story time. So we can move right into talking about writing lessons that we have learned from Lord of the Rings, which is awesome. So I thought first off, we will talk about ranking our fir- our favorite Lord of the Rings books. So favorite to least favorites. So my favorite is The Two Towers um, and then The Hobbit and then uh, Return of the King, and then uh, Fellowship of the Ring. So that's my order. Mm. I think the way I ranked it in my head is either I separate all of the books out and then I have a really hard time doing it, or I just take the Lord of the Rings as one book and then also count in The Hobbit Mm -hmm. and The Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. Um, So taking The Lord of the Rings as one book, I would say... I would rank them Lord of the Rings, Silmarillion, and then Hobbit. Um, If I'm just talking about Lord of the Rings itself, I would say Return of the King, Fellowship of the Ring, and then The Two Towers. But I think that Silmarillion might be higher than Two Towers. The Hobbit might even be higher than Two Towers. I don't know. So I (laughs) I can't break it down. (laughs) Janelle, you look so horrified. (laughs) Anyways, just So, Janelle, it looks like you're the only one who has the two towers in their top portion. Because for me, two towers is at the bottom. Sorry. Um, (laughs) So, for me, my favorites go The Hobbit and The Silmarillion are tied for my favorite. And then The Return of the King, The Fellowship of the Ring, and then The Two Towers. Um... Yeah, so I'm really interested to hear, Janelle, why The Two Towers is your favorite. So let's talk about what makes our favorite Lord of the Rings books our favorite. Yeah, oh, guys, you're killing me. So <laughs> I I have a soft spot for, like, everything going to chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, and so disintegrating plots are, like, I love it. And I love ones that are skillfully done, um, like The Two Towers is. Um, and I really like... Um, dark themes um Mm -hmm. themes that explore dark uh, topics and issues um without uh being uh too dark i guess um and then i really enjoyed mary and pippin their friendship i think it is completely underrated by i think it gets overshadowed by frodo and sam's uh friendship Mm -hmm. and so i love um that aspect of it and then the ents um i I don't understand. How how could you not love this book? <laughs> the answer in there and uh, Isengard and that whole battle. Um, and then Gollum's character arc is really explored in this one. Um, and it's a depressing character arc, um, mm-hmm. but it's very, very deep. And I also have a soft spot for like depressing character arcs I know <laughs> it's weird. Um, and then of course the ending is depressing and heart-wrenching um, and I like depressing endings <laughs> so <laughs> I I'm really you guys I'm not a de- like really like dark depressing person though I'm very optimistic but when I when I read I like to be kind of transported out of my world and so I think that might be why <laughs> I like that mm-hmm. um, but the two towers I don't know it's it's fantastic you guys, come on. <laughs> when I say that it's not my favorite, that doesn't mean I don't like it. This is probably <laughs> my favorite series ever. It, I would rank the Two Towers way higher than most other books. <laughs> but I think it's like what, good you, enough. what good you enough. love about it is what makes it harder for me. One, mm. yeah. So I, I really love Return of the King because... Uh, of all the denouement because of wrapping everything up and getting to see like this is the consequence of what they did and their sacrifice and all of their struggling was all for this beautiful thing and now Middle Earth is good again and the Shire is saved and all the beautiful things happen um, and I know that the ending wouldn't be as good without the hard part in the middle but that doesn't necessarily mean that I enjoy the hard part <laughs> but which it sets I, it up you know it sets it up to be so satisfying I know it, but I get through it because I know oh the good <laughs> end is coming and that's what I want to live in I love that the ending of the Lord of the Rings takes so long like mm-hmm. you're in the ending for such a long time it's not just hurried over right 
yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've read the books, but the two towers is the one where the characters are separated for most of the time. So there's a lot of point of view, like switching back and forth between different groups, right? Yeah, I think yep, that's, that's part of the reason I liked it too. <laughs> oh, the, I was gonna say that's the reason that I liked it least. I still really yeah. liked it, but it would always bother me because we'd get to like this climax, and then he would switch to another group of people, and then I would have to wait like fifty pages to figure out what happened to the other group, and it was very stressful and upsetting to me. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but my yeah, Janelle, when you switch point of view, you do it decently quickly Tolkien makes you wait half a book yes. <laughs> it's true but and you know what it's funny you guys mentioned that because yeah a lot of readers that's their main complaint with my books is that I have so many switches with point of views <laughs> um so it's not surprising but that people don't really like that but I don't know I love it I'm a weirdo <laughs> yeah uh, let's see oh so for me I liked the Hobbit probably the most because it's a little bit more accessible than the actual trilogy probably because it was written for a younger audience so I feel like it's easier for me to read there's less uh just like kind of extraneous descriptions and lore which is I love Tolkien but that's the one thing that really gets on my nerves about him um <laughs> and then uh I love the Silmarillion just because it's beautiful and creative and it's unique even beyond his regular level of uniqueness which is already super high um and I loved that the writing style really read like folklore a lot of his books already did but I think the Silmarillion took that to a whole new level which I loved mm -hmm. so. the history nerd in me just about dies and goes to heaven with the Silmarillion <laughs> it's so gorgeous mm -hmm. It's my uh, yeah. I didn't rank that. That would be my least favorite. So I, <gasps> we got out here. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, and I guess this is probably a good time for me to admit that I am one of those people that actually likes the Lord of the Rings movies more than I like the books. So I think it's good that we have this good mix of people with all different <laughs> sorts of views on this. <laughs> yes, we are well rounded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hmm. All right, so what good lessons have we learned from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings writing? Well, um, his prose is beautiful. Yes. I think we could all definitely agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, one of the things I love is how engaging it is with all of the senses. He's very um, show, not tell. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't rush through his world at all. Mm -hmm. um, you get a really, really good sense of being anchored there. Um, and, uh, his themes are deep and well thought out and they kind of explore areas that a lot of authors are kind of reticent to, to explore, but they're not shoved down your throat either. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, some of them are very, uh, hard to find. You have to search for them. So they're not as in your face. And so it's a, it's a good blend. I, I feel, um, and then his, every single, uh, one of his characters are multi-layered. Even side characters. Um, they're not surfacey at all. And their character arcs are very, um, they're varied. And in some of them, um, you have the character growing over that character arc. But in some others, you have them utterly disintegrating. Um, and so those are just some of the things that I've learned um, after reading him. Yeah. Yeah. I would really agree about the way that he takes his time and doesn't rush his world. Um, in our fast movie oriented society, I often feel like I have to get right to the point of the story right away, mm -hmm. but there's something so refreshing and relaxing about the way he takes time to build the story. And it feels so grounded and rich because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Another thing I learned from him is to go with your passions. His whole writing poured out of his love of language which mm -hmm. is yeah so weird and great and <laughs> didn't like, he create the language first and then yeah different? yeah that's incredible to me it is I love that so it makes me feel like yes I can take all of my history nerdness and all of my love of crochet <laughs> and just have stories grow from that um 
And I think that's a huge part of what makes his series unique because he did just really build it from Mm -hmm. his passion. Mm -hmm. Um, I love learning from him that friendships can be some of the most powerful relationships in Mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. The romances that do exist in Lord of the Rings are very lackluster and kind of like afterthoughts almost. But the friendships between the characters are the core of the book. And like Middle Earth would have fallen if there hadn't been such a strong friendship between Frodo and Sam. And all over and over again, you see these friendships grow and you get to like witness them grow stronger as they suffer together. Um, And I really love that. I love that we love the characters in a series more for their flaws. Mm -hmm. Like we love Boromir because he messes up and then because he's able in the last moment to change. Um, We love Aragorn not because he's perfect and amazing, but because he's human. He's great, but he's also accessible. Um, Mm -hmm. I really struggle with writing characters that have flaws so yeah um I think also he reminds me that it's okay to take your time with writing he took many many years to write this series and it turned out wonderful and has shaped our society hugely so that is something we don't have to rush stories um yeah, and then they can stories can be packed full of truth, even if it's not directly explicitly connected to the Bible. As a Christian fantasy mm-hmm. author, I feel like there's a huge temptation for me or for my readers to expect my stories to be like direct transfers from the Bible to this other world, but it doesn't have to be that. There are other ways to still have the same values and the same ideas, but be very creative. Um, And I also like that he doesn't answer every question that we have. Like, we don't really know much about who Tom Bombadil is. He's just (laughs) there. Uh, And we don't know what happened to the Entwives, and that's okay. (laughs) No, (laughs) I know, it's not okay. But he was okay okay with us not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. I loved Beth, your point about how he just took his time with a story, which goes back to what you were saying about his passions is I think because he was, he cared so much about the story that it led to him being willing to take his time and not feeling the need to kind of rush his publication and just get it out into the world. He loved it too much to do that. Um, yeah. And I just think that's really cool. Cause I know, especially nowadays, especially for, um, us indie authors, we always feel like we need to just keep publishing stories and we need to not lose this streak. So it's just story after story after story. Um, and it can get kind of stressful. So it's always nice to kind of look at authors and realize these people took their time uh, because they loved the story. And that is made a huge difference, which is, mm-hmm. has kind of helped me with my author life. Yeah. Um, and then for me I love how ingrained his themes are into his story you can't really have if you were to remove his themes from his plot line everything would fall apart and I think that's kind of the sign of an amazing story they're so entwined the themes are so entwined um it's just really beautiful like his themes of friendship if his themes of friendship weren't so strong the whole concept of the fellowship working together to defeat Sauron would have kind of fallen really flat um just because it would have been lacking that kind of special friendship feature um and then his themes of good overcoming evil if those weren't there then the fall of Mordor wouldn't have been so impactful because it would have just been like oh this kind of bad guy dies but instead it was like the symbol of evil that was overcome so it was really um it really added this extra yeah added an extra layer there we go um also he really knew his world and his characters which goes back to him taking his time um you get the sense that his characters and his world had a ton of backstory Um, Some of which he absolutely did share with us, and then some of them just didn't ever make it into his novels. Um, But it didn't matter because they weren't for the reader, they were for him. And it allowed him to get to know his world and his characters better so that he could write them with extra depth. Um, So that always makes me happy to remember that 
I need to know my world and my characters, but I don't necessarily need to put all of it into the published story. Actually, probably shouldn't. Otherwise, the I would end up annoying readers to a very huge extent. So <laughs> that's always a good thing to remember. Um, and then this this last thing is fascinating to me. He does overpowered characters really well. Um I think in fantasy or speculative fiction generally, we have this concept of like we can't have super powerful characters because usually the, that goes terribly wrong. Um, such as like the, what the DC universe has done with Superman. Like it kind of takes away all the suspense because you think, oh, well, this super powerful character can just save everything. So there's no need for any of this drama. Um, but he had these overpowered characters like in the Silmarillion, he had Fingal Finn. Um, who ended up like single-handedly taking on Morgoth and they were both massively overpowered, but because they were both overpowered, there was a sense of danger for both of them when they were fighting each other. Um, or even Smaug, he was just a really powerful dragon, but he had some massive character flaws that made you think, oh, well, he could actually lose this fight because he's kind of arrogant and doesn't really get what's going on here. So that to me has always made me happy because originally when I started writing I always thought I can't overpower my characters because that goes badly but Tolkien has a lot of examples of that working really well so I like to go to him whenever I'm working on overpowered characters so I can get tips so that's fun mm. that's good yeah yeah, yeah. uh also oh last thing um, I was literally just reading about this this morning, but he shared his writing, and I think that actually is super important because the story of the Hobbit's publication was that he gave the copy to a couple of people, such as, you know, C.S. Lewis, and also one of his students. The student ended up getting an employee of a publishing house to read The Hobbit, who then got the head of the publishing house to read The Hobbit, who then passed it on to his 10-year-old son, who read it and liked it, and that's how it got published, which is super cool to me because it was this chain of events. Um, and I know authors are always really hesitant to share their stories because it's kind of awkward and that's a piece of us that we're giving over to other people. But he was brave enough to do that, and then it ended up leading to the publication of his story, which is really cool. So... That is cool. I did not know that story. Yeah, I didn't either. So, yay, Google. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that's kind of it as far as our lessons that we've learned from Tolkien. Unless, did we skip anything? Did anybody have extra points? Oh, there's so much good. I know I'm probably missing some things. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also been a while since I've read it, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, I know. I'm sure I'm going to go back and reread them and think, oh, you should have talked about these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay, so what about cautionary tales from from Tolkien? What are some things that you've learned from him as far as re read, reading his books and thought, yeah, I should make sure I don't do this because this is not a good idea? <laughs> um, one thing I think for me, it goes back to the reason that I'm not as fond of two towers as I am of the other ones is if you're going to switch point of views and if you're going to separate your point of view characters like have them go to massively different parts of the map um, mix it together don't keep them apart for massive chunks of text because your readers will be really sad and miss them and be frustrated <laughs> um, but mixing them together can also build tension while not making your readers as unhappy um, one thing, like, I don't dislike any of the characters. I really love the way they are. I just wish there was a little bit more gender distribution among them. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, there's diversity in the world. And even when you're traveling, you're going to meet people of both genders. So that is a good thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And... Also, no matter how amazing your story is, not everybody will be a fan. I like Tolkien's work is gorgeous and had so much time and effort put into it. And it has obviously stood the test of time. But you'll find so many people who just do not like the stories and don't mesh with it. So 
no matter how perfect your work is, there will be criticism. There will be people who have strong opinions, both in favor and against. Janelle, you were kind of smiling when Beth was talking about gender distribution. Did you have a comment about that? Because I was like, I saw that face. I'm like, I want to know what that means. I was having self-control, you guys. Don't open up that can of worms with me. You just, that's a whole nother podcast. All right. (laughs) Um, Let's see. But yeah, Beth, I agree with all of those things. Because even when you look at, I was trying to think of an example of a modern day story that only has characters of one gender and the only one I could really come up with was the Maze Runner Um, but that was like there was an intention behind that so I'm never sure with Tolkien whether that was like intentional or just kind of a product of the times Um, so yeah if you're if you're going to write a story with only one gender you should probably have a pretty good reason for doing that (laughs) yeah I it's my biggest pet peeve with Tolkien's writing. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to say anything because I will literally get on top of a soapbox and won't come down for like 30 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I literally got into a somewhat heated discussion with one of my coworkers who was saying that Tolkien was like sexist or anti-feminist or whatever, which I don't believe that he was because all of the female characters he has are incredible um, and they're very powerful and hold a lot of influence. Um, but he still had the issue of not having enough of them. So, <laughs> yeah, you're right, Janelle. There's a lot of different things to explore so for this. So I'm just gonna. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, he's he's an amazing. All I mean, his story is amazing. So oh, I, yeah. I can overlook that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, my biggest pet peeve for him. Um, is it just oh, so much irrelevant information goes into those stories. Even if it goes to like pages of just descriptions of trees, like the dude really loved trees. <laughs> I don't know what was up with that. Um, and his prose is beautiful. And so I don't mind reading his, you know, multiple paragraphs describing landscapes or whatever. But it's also not super important to the story. So after a certain point, it gets a little annoying. Um, and so to me, that always reminds me whenever I'm writing description or even adding lore or background information about characters, I need to make sure to ask myself, is this important? Do my readers need this? Um, and if the answer is no to both of those, probably don't include them unless you're planning on ticking off your readers, which I guess you could go that route. I don't know why you'd want to, though. (laughs) So... Uh, It's true. There can be too much showing and not enough telling, um, Mm -hmm. for sure. That was the main thing that I would say about any cautionary tales is, you know, we always hear, show, don't tell. But honestly, sometimes you can go the other route. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like you said, even though the prose is beautiful, um, he tended to ramble about things that weren't all that important. Um, Get, you know, take forever to get to the point. Mm -hmm. So I agree this is a good principle for us, but I was recently talking with a friend about how back when he was writing and when all the the classic authors were writing, they didn't have TV. People lived in their town. They probably didn't travel very much. So a lot of the reason there were such detailed descriptions and comparing it to all these different things was to help readers who had very limited understandings of the world build more complex ideas. So I think... Like, for somebody who had not traveled, who just lived in a small English town, the descriptions would have been really helpful. It would have been, like, the establishing shots in movies. Mm -hmm. Um, But now, because we have movies and we see all these real and imaginary places that look very different, we can build a lot more concepts of things with very few words. That's That's a very good point. Yeah, I guess what works for one time period doesn't work for another. Because now that I'm thinking about it, a lot of books from his time period did have so much description of things that weren't super necessary, but probably weren't necessary for me because, you know, Google and college and all these things. So <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Cool. But we probably shouldn't follow his example in that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Times, <laughs> I don't times know. have changed. There's a middle ground. There's definitely a middle ground, though. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, world building is important. That's incredibly important with speculative oh, yeah. fiction, especially in fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's, you can, 
be descriptive without being overly descriptive. Um, but you've got to have it in there. Mm-hmm. That is true. Yes. Right. Especially when the settings are so brand new. Like so many of the things in his stories were just, you didn't find them in any other stories. So whenever you're writing and there is something that's just really unique to you, then yeah, you should probably spend some time exploring that a little bit more for the sake of your readers. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, yep. Cool. So any other cautionary tales? We really didn't have very much for him. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. Cool. All right. So people often talk about Tolkien as being the forefather of epic fantasy um, because epic fantasy really didn't exist up until his publishing Lord of the Rings. Uh, So how do we think that this has helped the genre? genre? Uh, I think that it helped by setting a really high standard of excellence. Uh, The genre of high fantasy has this, this, originating thing that is so well done and so thoughtful and so much time and effort was put into it that we expect that if not that level of care and commitment to be put into fantasy stories we still expect there to be a lot of thought and intention and background and world building done um and i think that that's good that we have that high standard to look to it would be really easy to cut corners otherwise yeah yeah that's good um yeah it was innovative i mean i i don't think you could say enough honestly about how um innovative and uh different it was for the time mm-hmm. and um every epic fantasy is now compared to this for a reason um you know, there's new languages, new cultures, new government systems, magic systems, races. I mean, hobbits, you guys. Yes. Hobbits. Like, come on. It's awesome. Yes. And, you know, it opened up this possibility of new worlds to be explored. Um, who, who, I mean, I don't understand why people wouldn't want to read something like that. <laughs> Um, it, it just paved uh, the way for epic fantasy to be acceptable on a mass market level. Um, and I think it opened up the idea that fairy tales aren't necessarily just for children anymore. You know, it's for adults, too. And to kind of connect us back to that part of ourselves that longs for magic to be real, to for good to triumph over evil. And you know that it's going to triumph over evil in the end. Um, and so, you know, that's almost like a, a kind of a childlike type of delight. Um, and I, I think he kind of opened that door for us. Um, and like you said, The Hobbit was read by a 10-year-old and the 10-year-old loved it. And, you know, I at 32, you know, can read it and love it too. And so mm-hmm. that kind of connects us all together in a way that's yeah. super unique. It's super cool. Um, I also, I really love how his world building influenced every aspect of his story. And I think that that really changed not only epic fantasy, but pretty much any type of speculative fiction you'll read from that point onwards. Um, Everything that he had in his stories, as far as world building, really did affect the plot and the characters, um, as far as, like, why the elves weren't particularly thrilled about, you know, helping the Fellowship along, or, you know, going into battle, or why Legolas and Gimli didn't get along super well at first, and why their friendship was such a big deal. And just it it really it impacted every single point of his story. And I think that's a great example of how world building should be. And I think that that really helped people see how important it was. So that, to me, is like probably my favorite thing as far as the legacy that he left behind for epic fantasy. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just realized I have an extra page of notes for this podcast and I don't have it with me and I don't know where it went. So I'm going to be <laughs> ad-libbing it from here on out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, think, I think the question was how does um how did his legacy also hurt the genre? Yes, um, thank you. I, that yeah. was one of the questions, yeah. <laughs> so I will answer it. Um, expectations, at least for us right now. Um readers have expectations and good ones and for good reasons um i mean writers have them for that matter um and they you know readers tend to have this picture in their head of what epic fantasy should be you know the tropes Mm -hmm. of the genre monsters swords elves magic um 
And then when some writers kind of step outside of that box, it can be, you know, tempting for the reader to say, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't do that. Yes. And uh, Tolkien kind of set that bar. He set that expectation. Um, and so I think on one hand, like I said, it's a good thing. But on the other hand, I think um, it can be a bad thing. Um, and, you know, he was a, tra a trailblazer um, and he set those expectations. Yeah, um, I think that's an instance of like people misunderstanding what made him great. Like the yeah. elves and swords and all of those tropes weren't what made him good. What made him good was that he created all of these things and fit them right. into his own unique world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that that is the big um, drawback that people do tend towards mimicry instead of innovation, when what made him great was his innovation, like you guys have been saying. Mm -hmm. um, instead, readers expect it, but also writers, especially new writers, tend to really lean heavily on mimicry, like, oh, I must have elves, and they must be really lofty and elegant. <laughs> and all-knowing and powerful <laughs> um there must be these adventures that are meandering mm -hmm. um and i have nothing against those things i love them but they're they need to be there with a purpose yeah or you can create your own things and that is also wonderful like hannah's desert elves yeah. who are not very much like tolkien's elves <laughs> But it is wonderful because they're innovative. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, I found my notes now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I totally agree about the whole mimicry. Um, I think the other thing is that it's also set the standard for epic fantasy being a little bit inaccessible. Like right now and ever since Tolkien, epic fantasy tends to be really long stories um, there's usually glossaries involved and timelines and like family trees. Um, and I don't. Appendices. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm clearly not a fan of those things. So I love Tolkien, <laughs> but I will say that you really shouldn't need glossaries or appendices or family trees or anything in order to understand the story. Um, I mean, it's, it's cool. And it's one of those things that it's fun to read through after you finish the story. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of authors have taken the fact that Tolkien did that and then incorporated it into their stories. And now we just have these unnecessarily long stories with really long glossaries and, you know, made up languages that weren't super well thought out and just all sorts of things that just make epic fantasy kind of daunting to read sometimes, which is really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because it's fantasy does not mean it needs its own language, says the woman who is making up her own language for her <laughs> fantasy. Um, but I'm doing it sparingly because it's not my strength, and I know that. Um, and I, I was actually listening to The Fellowship of the Ring, the beginning of the audiobook, earlier today. And it is so lovely and so great, but it is a long info dump. And mm -hmm. It's the best way to do an info dump, but like you're saying, that isn't the best way to engage readers now, and there are other ways we can get that information across. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing, one of the things that cracks me up is, I think because of Tolkien, I always think of epic fantasy as really long and just long reads and have this really specific, like, bulky thing in mind when I think of epic fantasy. So I think at some point, somebody read one of my stories and titled it Epic Fantasy. And I remember thinking, no, like, it's a short story. It can't be Epic Fantasy. And then I realized, oh, no, <laughs> it can be. <laughs> so I think that was a really important realization for me is that Epic Fantasy doesn't always have to be these massive novels. Like, that's not what makes Epic Fantasy epic. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So I think that's as far as uh, we have everything that we have for Tolkien. Did we have any extra thoughts or takeaways? I, I love what Beth said about passion, about mm -hmm. Tolkien following his passion. I think that's the main thing uh, us as writers can walk away with is writing about what makes us passionate. And um, 
what, uh, not necessarily what we know. And, and, and that's the important thing about fantasy is we're making this all up as we go. <laughs> and yes. you don't have to have everything figured out. And I think that's the problem with a lot of writers is over outlining, over glossering, like you were saying, all of that. But we, we really don't know what we're doing. So it's okay if all of the pieces aren't put together. Re the, uh, epic fantasy readers are forgiving um, when it comes to not answering questions not going down certain rabbit trails, not exploring every single character. Um, and so if you're writing about what you're passionate about, um, you don't have to have it all figured out. Yeah. And for me, I think the biggest takeaway is be creative. Um, yeah. Don't fall into boxes and challenge yourself to be something new, not like other writers, but also to bring something new to new to you like challenge yourself to push mm -hmm. the boxes in all directions yeah mm -hmm. yes i have nothing to add to that that was beautiful thank you <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh let's talk about book club um we can talk about everything that we're reading i personally right now i'm reading uh, i don't know how to pronounce the title it's either depth or department h uh anyway it's a comic book by matt kent and it's this weird like it's underwater dystopian sci-fi but also kind of a murder mystery so it's a blend of like a bunch of different genres and it's incredible the artwork's beautiful and the writing's beautiful and i'm really enjoying it uh and then i'm also reading or i guess oh sorry did somebody say something Nope. Oh, no. Not bad. Um, I'm also listening to A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. And honestly, this was a book that I picked up just because I really liked the title. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's actually pretty good. It's a little bit stilted and preachy at points, um, but the writing is really interesting and the world building is pretty cool so far. So I'm going to stick it out. And uh, let's see, I am reading um, Sewing by uh, Angie, I think, I have no idea how this is pronounced, um, Grigolionis, maybe? <laughs> Angie Grigolionis, I have no idea. Anyway, it's called Sewing, um, and it was in um, uh, the top 10 for SFPBO 2018. Um, really good. It's about two sisters um, <clears throat> and their kind of, their relationship and about, I don't know. 30% of the way through, and it's fantastic. Um, and I'm also uh, reading A Wizard of Earthsea um, yes. by Ursula Lagine. Is it Lagine? I have all of these weird pronunciations of names um, of books I'm reading. I have no but, idea. I've been calling it her Le Guin. I don't know if that's Le right, Gwen? though. Yeah. Um, either way, it's interesting. I expected to like it more. Oh. Um, I do enjoy it now. Don't get me wrong. I do enjoy it. But um, I think everybody had hyped her so much that I had really high expectations. Um, and so the uh, pacing uh, has been a little bit off for me. Um, but it is more leaning towards classic. Yes. Um, so that was more acceptable, you know, in the 60s when she wrote it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's good. And then um, I'm reading uh, Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Um, huge fan of Sanderson. And then I'm also reading Black Water Rising by Ada Kalak. Cool. Now, Oathbringer, talk about massive fantasies. Isn't that like 8,000 pages long it or something? Makes me so happy. <laughs> so happy. Yeah. Um, um, not including the books that I'm reading with students that I'm teaching. Um, because there's way too many. I just finished reading Fantasties by George MacDonald. Um, it's mm. an adult fairy tale. He actually was one of C.S. Lewis's inspirations. So a friend recommended it to me. Um, it was very different than I expected. I liked the beginning. I barely made it through the middle. And then I adored the end. So quite interesting. Um, I've been listening to Harry Potter on audiobook on my drives home. It makes traffic enjoyable, which is quite a feat. So I'm currently partway through Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. 
And then I'm also reading Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis for Author Book Club. Um, This is one I'm rereading. It's a retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche, and it is gorgeous. It's very ancient, and it doesn't sound like C.S. Lewis. Like, it has a very strong voice for the main character, and I am so excited to be back in it. Yes. I love that book. It's probably my favorite by him. Oh, it's so good. It's amazing. There's like an ending scene that made me cry, which I like never cry with books. So that was, it's just an incredible story. I'm really excited that you're reading Mm -hmm. it for Author Book Club. (laughs) I'm also excited. (laughs) Yay. All right. So that is it for this podcast. I don't know. I keep misplacing my notes, so I don't know what I'm supposed to be saying. Oh, okay. So, if you would like to, uh, and we highly recommend it, you should visit our website at www.phoenixfictionwriters.com. We're on Twitter at phoenix underscore fiction, and also on Facebook. So, you should definitely check out our website. Say hello to us on Twitter. We love interacting with you. And as always, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. And if you're on iTunes or uh, Google Play, you can leave us a review. That's really appreciated. It makes a huge difference for us. So it only takes a couple of minutes. So please do that if you have the time. And, of course, leave a comment about your favorite Lord of the Rings books and your thoughts on the two towers, because I think Janelle needs a two-tower lover buddy. So (laughs) if you like the two towers, give her a shout-out. That will make her happy. Yes, do it. Yes. Uh, you can find me personally on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and at hannahheathwriter.com. So um, obviously give me a shout out to um, tell me about all of your favorite things about Tolkien. And Beth, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Beth underscore Wangler, which is W-A-N-G-L-E-R. And you can My website is bethwangler.com, and I also always love to talk about Lord of the Rings, so feel free to come and talk with me about it. Yes, and you can find me at Janelle G. Ryder on Twitter and uh, JanelleGarrettWriter.com. And please, somebody, shout out about the Two Towers and Fangirl with me. Come on, guys. (laughs) Get it together. Don't leave Janelle (laughs) hanging. Um, (laughs) Yes. Two Towers Lovers Unite. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, Let's see. Oh, and then next month for the month of March, our next podcast will be on tips for writing short fiction. And that's going to be with E.B. Dawson and special guest Grace Crandall. Uh, Her short stories are amazing and you can read them on her blog. So I'm going to link that below because you all need to check it out so you can be prepared for the awesomeness in March. Uh, Yeah, so that is all I have for this month. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Beth and Janelle, for the awesome Lord of the Rings conversation. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Bye. Bye.